Good morning. Welcome to the fourth meeting of 2016 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Before we move to the first item in the agenda, can I remind everyone uh, to switch off mobile, mobile phones uh, and electronic devices as they may affect the broadcasting system. However, you may notice that some committee members are consulting tablets during the meeting. This is because we provide meeting papers in digital format. The first item of business on the committee's agenda this morning is to consider whether to take item five in private. Do we have the agreement of the members to do that? Yes. We do. Um, so can I also take the opportunity to welcome Jenny Goldruth to the committee? Uh, under agenda item two, can I invite Jenny to declare any interests she may have that are relevant to the work of the committee? Uh, I have nothing to declare other than that is already uh, declared in my register of interests. Okay, thank you very much. The third item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence from the Committee on Climate Change on its 2016 progress report on reducing admissions in Scotland. So can I welcome Lord Devon, the Chairman of the Committee on Climate Change, and Matthew Bell, its Chief Executive. Uh, uh, thank both of you for coming along today. You did, did, of course, give evidence to the predecessor committee, the Rural Affairs Committee. Um, so it's great to have you back. Um, we have a series of questions for you, uh, gentlemen. But can I start by, by just with a general point? I mean, um, what's your overall view of Scotland's progress in cutting emissions since 1990? Well, thank you very much for welcoming us. We're very pleased to be here. Uh, the first thing is that uh, Scotland is doing better than any other part of the United Kingdom. Um, and I'm unashamedly using it as a means of chasing other people to do better. So please keep on with it. It's a very valuable thing from our point of view. Um, that uh, ought to be said and said strongly and I'm slightly uh, uh, annoyed that uh, some of the press reports emphasised the downside rather than started off as we had started off by saying 2014 yes of course it happened to be true that the weather was helpful and other things but if you take that out it's still true that the policies and programmes of the Scottish Government actually have made a significant difference and you are meeting the targets and the target uh, is a tough one. And it seems to me that unless one starts there, it's much more difficult then to go on to say, but there are other things that have to be done. But, but a, a bit of congratulations and thanks comes first and I want to say that. It, it does get progressively more difficult, of course, and it becomes more difficult because you have been very successful in facing up to the questions of the power sector. Um, and that means that as that uh, becomes less, there's less opportunity there because of success, then transport and agriculture become very clearly the next areas of uh, demand. And both of them are difficult. Uh, more difficult than the things. This is not a question of low-hanging fruit. It just is that there are certain things that are more difficult. And, of course, agriculture has a higher proportion of emissions in Scotland than it does in other parts of the United Kingdom. And, therefore, you have uh, a specific problem. And that part of agriculture, which is uh, animal husbandry, uh, is, again, a bigger proportion of agriculture as a whole and a more difficult area to deal with. So we are very pleased with the amount which the government has done, pleased with the amount of advice that it has taken, the advice we gave last year, much of that has been implemented. Uh, and we have to go on and say, there are some things that really do need urgent attention and we've listed those. We'll come on and explore those in detail in due course. Uh, colleagues now have some questions to ask around this. Uh, Jenny Goldruth. Thank you very much. Devin, um, the committee notes that domestic policies are only responsible for a share of the emission reductions achieved to date. Um, are you able, therefore, to identify any specific UK policies that have contributed to reducing emissions? Well, uh, there are many policies that have contributed to it, but the UK as a whole is not doing as well as Scotland in, in specifics and we were able to disassociate the, uh, uh, the, the accidental reasons for improvement, weather and such like, from the real reasons mm -hmm. for improvement. Uh, that's not always easier over a larger uh, base where you're drawing from four different nations. It's not as easy. 
Um, but there's no doubt that uh, uh, some of the um, policies to improve uh, insulation and uh, dealing with uh, the need to reduce the sort of energy loss which comes from poor housing has been effective in uh, Wales, for example, has been effective too, to some extent, in, in, in England. But uh, you have made specifics, and that I think is worth saying. That, that would be true in every sector. In every sector, you could go through the series of policies, and on the power sector side, clearly renewable obligations and how the levy control framework works and how the auctions work, which are all set at a, at a UK level, has an impact on Scotland, but equally, local policies and planning issues and local support from the government here has an impact on the success of renewables and equally European level policies. The EU mm -hmm. emissions trading scheme uh, has a big impact there as well. And similarly, if you looked at transport, you could go through policies at a European level like fuel efficiency, car efficiency uh, ambitions, policies at a UK level like fuel duty and, and taxation and policies at a Scottish level like uh, approaches to parking and approaches to modal shift and things like that. So in every sector, there's this triage, if you will, of policies, some from Europe, some at a UK level, and some at a Scottish level. And we try to break that down in detail in the report, but also to be clear where progress can be made in areas that are under control of the Scottish government and where progress requires discussions either at a European level or at a UK level. Um, Yes, welcome. And can I ask you a question in particular about backloading in relation to the 2014 figures? I mean, it was obviously a significant aspect that a number of allowances were withheld. What, what do you see the impact of that going forward, particularly in the light of Brexit and the potential for you know, the UK not to be participating in the EU ETS anymore? I think the Brexit bit is, um, I, I, is very difficult indeed. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I clearly think it's a dreadful thing to have done, and I think it uh, will have very serious implications. But I think we have to face the fact that anybody who pretends to know what it will mean uh, is lying, because they don't know, even those who wanted it. And so we don't know what that effect would be, because all that's open for negotiations, and I notice that the Brexit minister has now said that these may be the most complicated negotiations ever don't seem to remember that having been said in the referendum, but there we are. Uh, so we're now faced with this situation, and I don't think it helps to, to postulate what might happen as far as that's concerned. Our belief is that the central issue is the public must know the truth. In other words, we must not allow the system to cover up whether we've done better or worse. And therefore, in every issue, whether it's backloading or whether it's um, uh, banking or any of the other things which can be done, the committee is very determined to m make it clear as to what has happened. And the area which will be most difficult will be that which is involved in moving from net to gross emission measurement which the Scottish Government has committed to, to do that in a way which doesn't make comparators impossible because the public must never feel that they're being misled. And so I see it in that cat mm -hmm. amongst that group of things. Mm -hmm. and that, that's why we try to be clear that's why we try to be clear in the report that uh, that the Scottish Scotland would have met its targets even had the backloading not taken place. Mm -hmm. And so there are all the different relatively complex accounting rules that, uh, that govern how the, uh, the target is actually defined and how we calculate whether it has been met or not. But in amongst that, then we try to be clear for Parliament and for the public about what the level of real progress is, sort of setting aside the accounting. And mm -hmm. Had the backloading not taken place, Scotland still would have met its targets. The fact that some of these ETS allowances have been sort of taken out temporarily, and the thought is that they would be put back in at a later date, means that you cannot count on that progress. So the extent of the overachievement is probably overstated if you, uh, if you look simply at the, at the simple figures. Um, 
but equally, we know there's a lot of discussion at European level about reform of the EU ETS, and even not, uh, notwithstanding any issues about Brexit, you would expect the EU ETS itself to reform over time, and part of that discussion is how you treat the, uh, the permits that have been temporarily taken out for, for backloading. Well, I guess it's a bit of a because if these allowances get brought back in the next couple of years, if we don't make progress on agriculture and transport, who knows, we may end up failing annual targets again. Well, I think that's, uh, in <coughs> objective terms, that's a possibility. What we have to do is to make it very clear what the reality is. Um, and the difficulty is that the EUTS uh, arrangements have huge advantages. The disadvantage is that you do not know in advance the proportion of, uh, uh, of the weight which will be on the United Kingdom as a whole. Um, and you have to make your budgets up without knowing that. And that's difficult. And it's very difficult for the public, leave alone experts at it, to understand how it works. Uh, my sincere apologies. We're going to have to suspend the meeting for five minutes. There are some problems with the recording system. There's no record being taken over the first few minutes. So please, um, we'll suspend now for five minutes. I Grab wish a I'd coffee. said something really outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go back to that. <laughs> so I suspend the meeting for five minutes.
Um, I'd like you to say we can now resume the meeting with apologies. Um, there was a low-level recording of the initial stages of the meeting, which should be sufficient for the purposes of the official report. So we'll just pick up where we were. So can I invite Alexander Burnett to ask some questions? Uh, good morning. Um, it was good to see that uh, Scotland uh, played its part in the UK's reduction uh, of eight, with around 8% in line with uh, both GVA and, and population. Uh, but as you mentioned, you know, there are a number of anomalies, uh, a, a negative in the farming and a positive in woodlands, which uh, obviously the, that average of 8% height you know, skews that. Uh, what do you see going forward in terms of Scotland's ability to play its, its, its share according to GVA and population? And uh, do you see any other sectors which again are going to uh, skew, you know, be, be masked by the averaging going forward? Clearly, it will depend very much on Scotland's ability to get in agriculture significant reductions. That's absolute. Uh, and transport is going to be the other area where that's going to be really necessary. And I think in both cases, the big issue is to clear out of the way the excuses before we start, you know, if you, if you take transport, for example, there's always the excuse that this is a big area and a small population, therefore it must be that we have a lot more long distance. Now, it is true that particularly for the carriage of goods, there is a special problem, but it's only a very small proportion of the total problem. And the big issue is how you reduce the impact of, uh, of transport in the central belt where the problems are very similar to any other urban area of the United Kingdom or beyond. And I just think one of the important things that committees like your own and others must do is to say, well, we're not going to be led astray by the easy answer, which tends to come out in that sort of half a, half a minute you've got on television. This is why we can't do it. Well, it isn't true. On agriculture, the, the, the really big thing is getting the basic measurements as to where we are agreed and accurate. For example, bringing the peat areas into the calculations, seeing where we actually are with forestry and what that really means, and, and making sure that the industry as a whole accepts that basic. Because unless we have a more effective baseline, then measurements in the future will be significantly difficult and we'll go on having as uh, as your chairman and I've talked about before that what I what I, what I call anecdotal um, compliance which is nonsense because you tell the anecdote that suits 
and not all the other anecdotes which don't suit. So it's that bit that I think is going to be the biggest problem for Scotland, and that has to be done at once. That, that bit has to be got right as quickly as possible. And we mustn't have the excuse that um, because the big issue is maybe uh, livestock, that the smaller things that you can do by uh, different methods of ploughing or no plough and all those sort of things, because that doesn't add up to a huge amount, there is a tendency to feel it's not worth doing. It is worth doing, not only because what it does add up to is worth it, but also because it gets the whole farming community into a spirit of saying, we have to play our part. Um, and if you don't get them to play their part in the areas which are relatively easy, then jumping immediately to the difficult part seemed to me to be almost impossible. Thank you. And just to add to that, we know that the, we know that the objective in general is to de-link economic growth from emissions growth, so de-link GVA from, uh, uh, from emissions growth. And an important part of that is what we do in terms of investment in infrastructure, investment in a range of things which contribute to economic growth, but can help to reduce emissions. And one of the sectors we haven't mentioned yet, clearly buildings and households, putting in place energy efficiency measures, putting in place low carbon heating measures, part of infrastructure renewal program, that is one component of allowing GVA growth to continue whilst continuing to reduce emissions. Right. Thank you. That's a very useful scene set. I will now start to drill down to certain sections. We'll start with uh, energy, uh, Angus MacDonald. Thank you. Convener, good morning. Lord Devon, good morning, uh, Mr Bell. Um, it's clear that we're making good progress on renewable uh, electricity generation and with a reduction in uh, overall uh, generation in Scotland, coupled with an increase in generation from renewables, it's, it's certainly progress indeed. However, um, your report highlights uh, a significant increase in the rate of renewable energy installation will be required to meet the target to generate 100% of Scotland's electricity from renewables by 2020. Now, there's clearly um, some progress with regard to tidal and wave, uh, which is moving at a pace. In fact, we, we saw some progress on that yesterday uh, with um, the tidal turbines being placed in the, the, the Pentland first. Uh, thanks to a £23 million investment from uh, the Scottish Government. But there's, there's still you know, bits where we're, we're, we're not exactly moving forward as fast as we would like, for example, in, in district heating. Um, there's, we're clearly not meeting our targets with regard to district heating, although I'm pleased to say that there is an um, exciting initiative in my constituency uh, for a, a, a large district heating project in Grangemouth, which uh, is a major industrial uh, complex, uh, providing cheaper heat to, to the massive uh, petrochemical plant and further afield, including council buildings, etc., etc. But it's still at an early stage, but hopefully we'll see it progress uh, pretty soon. And it's an, an initiative, I have to say, that was first mooted in the 1950s, so, uh, and then got mentioned every decade since. So it's a case of better late than never, and we're definitely getting there. But I'd be interested to hear what your view is on, on the progress made in cutting emissions from the energy sector as a whole and, and where we can improve. Well, I think that's a very useful uh, exemplar because one of the problems we have uh, in Scotland and elsewhere in Europe as a whole is the difficulty of getting people to think differently. And, uh, and uh, district heating is a very good example of that. There's a sort of instinctive dislike of the... Of, uh, I'm, uh, you have to get over those things. Uh, another example, which is true in Britain, but not true in, uh, uh, in Germany or in Scandinavia, is our refusal to accept uh, uh, ground source pumps or air source pumps. We just find it hugely difficult to get these... Uh, to be uh, installed. And uh, if I were your committee, I, I think I'd be pressing uh, the Scottish Government to look much more closely at the behavioural sides of uh, these things. We, we've just put on to our committee um, a behavioural scientist. It's the thing that I wanted to do when I became chairman, because I do think we've got to find ways of saying there are certain things, and ground uh, source heat pumps is a very good example of it, 
District heating is another very good example. There are certain things where the technology is there, where you can make a real change, which really works, and the problem is that people just say, I, I, don't, I don't like it, I don't think it works, I'm not happy with it, doesn't it mean I've got to have my heating on when they tell me and not when I want it? All those things come into that. And I think if I were putting a priority, it is really working hard on how you help people to realise the opportunities which really are there. Um, this is a government and this is a cross-party uh, agreement which ought to make those things available. It's the general populace that we've got to, to engage. Okay, thank you. I mean, certainly, behavioural change is, is the key. I mean, we just have to look across the North Sea to, to Norway where there's a high uptake of, of uh, air source and uh, ground source heat pumps. Um, it's, it's taken as read over there that that's what you put in. Um, there's no, no questions asked. So um, clearly, behavioural change is a must. There's no doubt about it. Finley Carson wants to come in. Yeah, it's just on the back of that, uh, the behavioural changes. Um, what emphasis or what recognition is given to the importance of future energy storage, particularly with renewables, where we see the pattern of energy production is very variable and it doesn't always fit in or with uh, people's behaviour. What emphasis have you put on future ener energy storage as a, a method of, of reducing energy consumption? Well, we're, we're very keen on energy storage of the two different sorts, at least generally different sorts, which is uh, uh, carbon capture and storage, which we think is an essential part of uh, enabling us to use gas for longer periods. Um, and air electricity storage, which obviously increasingly would contribute to making uh, intermittent production part of the base load, because if you could do that, it becomes unimportant that it's intermittently produced. I'm always a little leery about it, because what I don't want to have, there's always people in politics, he says after being in politics himself for a very long time, <laughs> there's always people in politics who will grasp any excuse what I don't want is a situation in which people say, as some people do say, oh, well, Lord Deben, it's very easy, you know. I mean, we only have to wait for this to come and it'll come and it'll all be all right. And I don't want to get into that area because we don't know. I mean, we haven't got uh, even a full-scale exemplar, apart from what's happening in Canada, of the CCS. And as far as um, electricity storage, the reason we all think that it will be delivered is because so much money is going into it from so many successful businesses uh, who've been very good at the electronics and such like. So we think that it must be okay, but we haven't got it. So it must not be an excuse for not doing other things, but it is central. And if we can get that, it would change the whole face of it. And it may be that given the uncertainty of uh, renewed nuclear uh, contribution, which is part of the present uh, uh, panoply of things, um, this will have to be the mixture which, which delivers. And, and more generally, we tend to emphasise the importance of flexibility in the, in the power system, in the electricity system, and that includes storage, but it also includes the demand side that we were talking about and demand side response, and it includes a range of technologies that allow the electricity system to more flexibly respond to uh, respond to demand patterns and changes in demand patterns, and that's a, a range of technologies of which different storage technologies would be one component. And, and some of those are less easy to sell to the public. I mean, when you talk to them about smart grid, you then have to go into some explanation. Talk about energy um, storage, they understand that. Um, and we've got to, I mean, the truth is, uh, we are moving from a grid system which will look as out of date as the rutted roads of the uh, um, age before uh, metalled roads uh, when we get smart grids, when it will be wholly different. But there is that journey to, to, to travel, and there are many newspapers in particular who really, if they can find a reason why smart metering and smart grids can be attacked, will do so. Cross call. Thank you for the 
it's clear that we have made excellent progress in Scotland in you know, developing renewable energy generation, but there's still a lot more to go. And I think your report points out that we're effectively needing to more than double our installation uh, rate within the next couple of years to meet the, the 2020 target. I'm interested to know where you think that generation is going to come from. Is it going to have to come from offshore renewables? In which case, you know, there are some controversies at the moment surrounding offshore wind. Do you think we need to reinvest in onshore, perhaps repowering sites? Um, and what kind of subsidy regime would be required to, to support that? Uh, on the figures, are, you're right. What we say is that um, compared to what's been installed over the last few years, the rate of installation in the next few years to 2020 would have to increase quite substantially in order to meet your 100% uh, target. Having said that, what we also observe is that the, the projects that are in the pipeline and that are at various stages of development would be sufficient to meet that target. So it's not that there is, that there is no idea about the sets of projects that would be sufficient to meet the target, the things that are in the pipeline, were they to be brought forward and were they to be installed and operational by 2020, would be sufficient to meet that, uh, that 2020 target. And, as, and that's a combination, as you know, yeah. it's a combination of a range of different technologies of onshore uh, and offshore. I was just going to say that does assume, though, that there's a subsidy regime which means that that pipeline of projects are actually economically viable, and I think perhaps that's the, the difficulty the industry is facing at the moment. Well, I think it's very important to recognise that the, uh, the choice between the possibilities and the nature of the regime to achieve that end is bound to be a political decision. It's not a decision for the Climate Change Committee. What we have to do is to say, here is a range of things which you, from which you can choose and put together, and this is the figure you've got to meet. Um, and can we point out that this is an advantage or that is an advantage? But in the end, it is for politicians in the mixed economy that we have between Scotland and, uh, and uh, the United Kingdom and uh, uh, the European Union, it's for politicians to, to decide what is the politically acceptable mix of those things. Um, my only determination is that it should be a mix. The, the danger, I think is if politicians decide that there's only one way forward and there's not going to be anything else. Because once you get into picking winners, uh, we have such a terrible history uh, in every country and every sort of politicians. Uh, right from, I'm so old that I can remember the ground up scheme, I mean, right from very early days when we thought we knew how to do that, it, we don't. So you need to have a range of things, and of course it's, it's uh, more expensive than if you pick the right one, but it's a darn sight cheaper than when you pick the wrong one. So you have to do that, and so I, I, I do think that we do have a duty to remind the government that going down one route and having one answer is a very dangerous one indeed. Uh, Morris Golden. Hello. Uh, thanks for uh, coming today. I was just interested in how we manage electricity demand in particular. You've mentioned earlier, and I'd be interested to hear your views on at a micro level, so smart meterings, household level, but also at a, 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 at a national level the impact of uh, managing uh, that demand via industrial uh, units. So obviously in Scotland, we have, we have an issue in terms of uh, transmission um, uh, capacity. So would, for example, the introduction of an electric arc furnace, which are used uh, in other places across uh, Northern Europe as a means of managing that, that demand rather than use of uh, constraint payments, and also the, the kind of more general issue of Tenuos uh, uh, payments, both obviously electricity generators in Scotland are paying those and English uh, consumers are paying uh, on the other side of things. So looking at that demand management overall at a micro level and at the national level. Well, first thing is we've got to get a lot better at doing it and we've got to learn a lot from other people. Uh, I'm very conscious in this particular area, the amount of reinventing the wheel that goes on. Um, I'm amazed, if you look at some places where you never think of it, but the demand management that the 
Southern Texas Electricity Company does by arranging a special deal with all its, um, uh, those who've got the technology of its customers so that it shaves a very small amount automatically off their use in, in times of peaking and the cost reduction so great that they have a check in the post every month for doing that. They enter into a voluntary operation. And it, now I take that as an extreme example, but uh, because it comes from Texas, where you would have expected it not to have come from at all. And it seems to me that we have to recognise once again that, first of all, there's a lot to learn from other people. Secondly, you can do a huge amount by using modern uh, technology in the home not just the sort that we've been talking about in terms of smart metering, but being able to turn on the electricity from your, um, uh, from your smartphone so that you don't have to use old-fashioned things when it comes on at your usual time when you decide that you're not going to go home as early as you normally do. I mean, those sort of things really can make a huge difference if, if you use it. And, of course, you know that you are saving money for you <laughs> which is a very important part of the encouragement that you have. So I suppose my main uh, uh, comment is that some of these things are very complex and the government has to be involved in how the big utilities really do step up to the mark. I mean, one of the things that is I am very critical about is that if you look at the energy saving in the mechanism of delivering electricity, and just the mechanism, so to speak, it's pretty difficult to see that there have been huge steps forward. And I think there's a big pressure on the utilities to become much more uh, fleet of foot and much quicker at uh, introducing new technology and much better at explaining to the public why it's in their interest to use this. I, I'm, I do think this attempt to suggest that if you've got a smart metering, it's a kind of spy in the cab, you know, the sort of thing that they, they use to, to a, a, attack the tachograph, when actually it's a means of you saving money for yourself. So uh, I think they've got to be much better at selling this. And in the end, uh, commercial operations make their money by selling their products. Why they can't understand that they ought to be selling this as well is a problem for me. Level in terms of you know encouraging you know industry to take on that electricity demand as a way of avoiding uh, heavy constraint payments. I think that's a very important part, and one of the things that we have been concentrating on is uh, the degree to which we haven't seen the savings in uh, in the industrial field that you might have expected given the pressures on it, and I think we've got to look at that much more more closely. Yeah, the, uh, there's been increasing success because the National Grid has had increasing success in its auctions and its contracts with industry to try to enter into voluntary arrangements. Mm -hmm. um, and it becomes important that those are seen as genuine voluntary arrangements. Again, sometimes you get the, 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 uh, the overblown reaction to industry turning down its production at times of peak. Uh, electricity demand or energy demand as, a, as something that's a, a negative outcome and, and reducing UK manufacturing, but actually what it is is shaping your manufacturing to when it's cheapest mm -hmm. to, do, to do the production and being able to make those adjustments becomes very important. And, and more generally on the details of some of the things you were mentioning, the transmission charging and uh, the arrangements that are in place for pricing flows of electricity, which clearly sit with sit with off gem. I think at this at this level, the important thing is that the climate change targets, the need to meet 2020, 2030, 2050 targets, need to be an explicit part of those conversations and of that of that discussion. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then you know it's for it's for off gem rightly to then decide precisely what mechanisms are in place and what the pricing arrangements are to meet the objectives that collectively we have set, of which the climate change ones are an important part. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Claudia Beamish, finally on this uh, section. 
Thank you, convener. Good morning to you both and welcome. Uh, could I ask you if um, the committee sees a place for inclusive models such as cooperative models and community models in relation to um, energy uh, at all levels in Scotland? And also whether the committee has any view on uh, whether there is a place for, to use a generic term, fracking in, rela in relation to climate change uh, as a transition fuel. Thank you. Well, as to um, community-based uh, uh, generation, um, I'm personally a great believer in this. Uh, I think part of the success of the Germans can be put down to the fact that half their uh, renewable energy is in the hands of cooperatives or local communities in one form or another, and therefore there's a much wider commitment to the success of renewables than there is in other countries and certainly in uh, the United Kingdom. So uh, very much in favour of that and finding ways of doing it. And I think it's interesting that they, it, it, I don't think we can just blame governments either in Scotland or in uh, the United Kingdom for this not being very advanced because there's no doubt that the cooperative movement in Germany uh, did take a very active, proactive part in, in doing this in a way which has not been true in, in Britain for all sorts of different reasons, but that, that so, so, so we've, we have to energise it. Um, as far as fracking is concerned, we, we've taken a very clear view, which is that it's only if the very tough uh, requirements which we've laid down are met that fracking can be um, a part of uh, a society which is committed to meet the fourth and fifth carbon budgets. Our job is to set the budgets, set the uh, parameters, uh, and to be very clear as to what you can and cannot do within those things. But once one has been clear about that, the choice of where you do it and which bits you do is really up for the government. It's the government to decide whether it wants to have fracking or not on whatever basis it does, UK or Scotland. But we have said, if you have it, you have to meet certain very clear, three very major requirements. And if you don't meet those three requirements, then fracking is inimical to meeting our fourth and fifth carbon budget, which the nation has accepted. So it's a very real and clear statement. We don't have a philosophic opposition to fracking, but we do have a very clear uh, statement about what you have to do to make sure that it would be within the budgets which we've laid down. Thank you very much. We'll move on. Transport now, and David Stewart has some questions. And your reports and your earlier contributions, I think, have highlighted that transport's an area where, frankly, we need to try a lot harder. As you know, it's 28% of emissions uh, in Scotland. How important is it to you to emphasise modal shift from car use to other forms of transport? It's clearly a crucial part. And we come back to that behavioural <laughs> concern, because um, it is one of the surprises of life that people will sit daily in a motor car in an a, 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 a absolute jam for an hour when they could get to the same place even on a convenient tram in a quarter of the time. But that's how some people operate. Now, one of the things we have to do is to understand more clearly how you move people. But there has been remarkable improvements and changes. Uh, I just think of where I live in the centre of London, where one is much more likely to be knocked down by a bicycle today than <laughs> almost any other form of uh, transport. I mean, it, it really has changed. I mean, there are very serious examples of how modal shift has, has changed. And in many uh, cities, the introduction of trams, for example, which, which people find more attractive than, than buses, they clearly do, and, and they use them, and uh, it's a, th there are many examples of that. I think we're more likely to get modal shift in that sort of area than some of the suggestions that people have of rather highfalutin ways of kind of getting more people to walk longer and further. I think you just have to move people very... You have to move them on to the... First of all, the possibility 
of not using their motor car. And then a slight shame in using your motor car for very short journeys is, is, is the thing that we, I think we're going to have to start thinking about. Because the real problem is the number of small journeys in motor cars in our big cities. And that is common to England, Scotland and, and, and Wales and the North Island. So you were mentioning earlier that this is, on one level, not really about technology itself. It's really down to psychology. It's yeah. about change yeah. of attitudes yeah. and, you know, the management mm. of change. And mm. um, I, I lived in London when congestion charging came in and hitting people in the pocket certainly paid off at one level. And certainly the huge investment into buses and the tube made a huge difference in yeah. London. You cannot expect people to make behavioural change if changing is inconvenient and really inconvenient. If you don't know when the bus is coming, I mean, I do think just knowing when the bus is coming is the, one of the biggest advantages of, uh, 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 and uh, producers of behavioural change. If you know it's coming in two minutes, you'll stand and wait for it. If you're just hoping, it's a very different choice. I think that real-time information, real -time is, information I think is, very important. is absolutely important. I mean, on the same theme, convener, I mean, how, how important is promoting ultra-low emission vehicles? Because clearly that's good practice in terms of having very low emissions in Scotland and across the UK. Well, I think both are important, aren't they? I mean, uh, if you merely made a straight choice between uh, the present mode of uh, uh, propulsion and electric vehicles, you wouldn't have done much for the general problem of, uh, of congestion and the like. What you really are trying to do is two things. One is to make sure that the vehicles that you do use are, in fact, as low in uh, carbon as possible, uh, in emissions as possible, and also, at the same time, to create alternatives so that people do, in fact, use the roads more sensibly in terms mm. of, uh, mm. of the capacity. And that's all about using our resources properly. I mean, what climate change says to us is it's not only the immediate thing about no. electric vehicles rather than uh, internal combustion engines, mm. but it's the longer term thing is how do you run our society in the way we want it to be run and the way it's run now with less demand on resources? Mm. And that one of the demands that you want to lessen is the building of roads mm. and mm. the uh, need for that sort of infrastructure. I think another area if I could raise convener is that on freight. And um, clearly it's important that we make uh, the ability to transfer freight from road to rail and indeed to sea easy for business. And I've spoken to many businesses in my patch in the Highlands and Islands when they say it's actually quite difficult to get freight onto rail. I'll give you one example of best practice. In previous committee I went to Rotterdam and as you may know they uh, paid for um, a direct freight only rail line from Rotterdam Harbour direct to Germany at billions of euros, which incidentally they've got European funding for, which takes me back to another point. Is it important then that we do encourage the movement of freight off, off the road, but also ensure that there's infrastructure there to ensure that businesses are able to do that in an easy way? I, I agree, and sometimes it isn't about big infrastructure. It's about uh, information and getting people to think about it. I mean, I remember in my former constituency I had... Britain's largest container port, uh, Felixstowe. And uh, until there was a change in the control of the railways, the, the, the only people who went on a new... If a new shipping line came in, the only people who went to try to get their business were the lorry companies. Mm. Uh, there was no sort of a, a attempt by the rail companies to do it. Mm. Now, with the competitive situation, the first people in their offices are very often the rail. And that's meant, of course, that we're actually under real pressure to provide enough rail connections. And mm. so sometimes it's not, it's not the huge things, it's the, the smaller things of making people think there is an alternative, there is a different way of mm. doing it. You don't need to do it like you've always done it. Mm. And just on, I'm not conscious of time, computer, uh, you mentioned in your report some very good best practice which you recommended, which was around urban consolidation centres. And again, in my previous yeah. committee, I visited one in Rotterdam, which, for those who haven't followed them, are systems where HGVs put freight to a common centre out with a city and use smaller, lower-emission yeah. vehicles to take it into the city centre. Obviously excellent for reducing emissions. Would you see that as a best practice for not just Scotland but the rest of the UK? Well, I'd certainly see it as best practice, and I think it's got to be spread, though, beyond the HGV area. It seems to me that... Um, uh, this is one of the things that we ought to do much more in construction. 
It's much easier if um, the gathering together of that which is needed for a construction site is done outside a city, so that your delivery is A, in a smaller vehicle, and B, uh, you have consolidated it already, so the number of, the, the number of uh, trips is, is, is much less. And also, um, we really do have to get to a construction industry which is on the just-in-time basis, because that's the only way that you, first of all, restrict uh, uh, the amount of traffic mm. that you have to do. And also, you save significantly because you don't have stuff uh, left on sites for long periods of time where they get broken and stolen. Mm. And, and therefore, there's every advantage. One of those areas where it really makes a difference, and one of our problems, both in Scotland and in the rest of the United Kingdom, is the construction industry is not always the most... Um, uh, modern and rapid and uh, uh, new industry. It does mm. tend to stick to what it knows works rather than trying mm. to find new ways of, uh, of proceeding. Because I'm getting a look from the convener. Um, is aviation obviously a big uh, a cause of emissions? What's your assessment of the Scottish Government's uh, policy of having a 50% decrease in APD? Well, I'm always very uh, <coughs> careful not to... Um, uh, take specifics and say I think that's a good or a bad thing because that is the role of the government to make those choices. But if you make a choice of that kind, you need to look and see what you have to do in other areas to balance that up. And it may well be that you say for social reasons that you want to do something which is more difficult as far as uh, emissions are concerned. But the thing I'm always pushing for is uh, very simple, is that if you do that, you have to say at the same time where you're going to make up for that, what what the total effect is on your budgets for for, for carbon, and what you're going to do to uh, cover that off, uh, and and it's only by us all thinking like that, because there are no absolutes in this except the absolute of of reducing our emissions, and the way you do it uh, is really a political decision, but part of that political decision is never avoiding the fact that any decision costs something. So what does it cost, and what do you intend to do to offset that cost? Mm. Thank you. One, one of the advantages that the uh, that Scottish Act has over the UK Act in that sense is that all aviation emissions are captured in the in the carbon targets and in the carbon budgets. And so there's, there's no question that there's a legal duty on the government if the result is to increase aviation emissions to offset them somewhere else to stay within the budgets. I mean, do you see an alternative to air passenger duty which reflects the true environmental cost of frequent flights while it's still tight, whilst at the same time meeting the Scottish Government's objectives? Well, you could do, if you decided to do all sorts of uh, uh, alternative systems, um, which might, uh, some would say, would be socially more equitable. You can do a range of things of that sort. But again, I think that is a really fundamental political decision which a government's got to make. And the, the fact that it is, under your system, unlike the rest of the United Kingdom, necessary if you uh, do something which is damaging as far as um, uh, air transport emissions to, to uh, compensate for that elsewhere, is only the second point of it. The first bit is, when you do it, you must be concerned to discuss what it might mean. And but it's got to be part of the whole ethos of the way you make decisions, so that decisions aren't made and then have to be caught up afterwards about emissions. Decisions are all made with the emissions effect as part of that decision. That's what I think we have to move towards. And you won't meet your tough targets unless, almost when you're buying the pencils, you're thinking about what is the emission effect of, of making this decision. Lord Devon, in the report you talk about the benefits of cutting the speed limit from 70 miles per hour, the upper speed limit, to 60 miles per hour, and indicate that would cut emissions by 8%. Can we possibly get to the point where transport makes an appropriate contribution without doing that? Again, I, I think our job is to remind people of the cost of doing certain things and of not doing certain things. And I don't think it's for us to say you ought to cut the speed limit to 60 miles an hour. 
But what we have to do is to remind people of the realities of having it at 70 miles an hour. And, and the fact is, you can, yes, transport can uh, meet the requirements by doing other things, but just remember, in each case, you are asking people to make choices. What you can't do is to do, and if I may make a very unsuitable remark, but you know how it is in a family. Uh, your wife says to you, or you says to your, uh, say to your wife, do you think we can afford such and such a thing? And you say, or she says, well, we could afford to do that, but we can't afford to do the other thing. But of course you don't want to do that, you want to do both. That's what the truth is. You, you, you want your partner to, to agree to the possibility of doing both things. And I think this is exactly the situation here. We have to say, if you don't do this, then if you want to meet the requirements, you've got to do other things, and you've got to decide which are the politically acceptable things. What you can't say is that we'll do neither. Um, and that's the issue. And that's why it's worth highlighting something which we know is politically very controversial, to say that would make a huge difference. So if you don't do that, where does that 8% come from okay. elsewhere? OK, thank you. So let's move on to another area that we need to do uh, to see a better return from, which is land use, agriculture, forestry, peatlands, etc. Uh, Kate Forbes. Thank you and good morning. I have a few questions on how we make more progress in agriculture. And one of the areas that you identified was um, the possibility of greater international collaboration. What are the opportunities that you identified that could give us more progress in agriculture with that international collaboration? Well, the Irish, the um, New Zealanders, the Finns, all countries with not dissimilar problems where agriculture has an important uh, part in their um, planning for climate change, all countries that want to do the best uh, are doing a lot of work in this area and a lot to learn from them and to cooperate with them. It seems to me that the New Zealanders in particular have been very concerned to see what they can do and it may well be that uh, Scotland would find that sort of cooperation with similar sized countries with the same problem of having a relatively small population in a very large area uh, and a very important role for agriculture uh, that that would be a very worthwhile thing. Matthew's been concerned with the um, New Zealanders and no doubt would like to add to that. Well, and, and there are different, I guess there are different types of cooperation. And at some level for agriculture and land use, it's understanding what works and doing the analysis and doing the trialing out different things, doing the research to try to understand what works. And that's clearly easier done, more easily done if several different countries are doing different things and they can pool their learning, their learning from that. Um, and then there are, there are other areas where it's about where, how do you balance the contribution that agriculture is going to make with wider land use change, whether that's forestry or whether that's more broadly how you, how you treat the land, how you think about soil uh, fertility and carbon stored in peatlands and in, in soils. And again, different countries will have different approaches and learning about what works or explicitly trying to coordinate research efforts. And finally, we know that in agriculture we don't have all the answers yet. And so there's research and development and there's innovation around animal feed, around a range of things that still has to take place in order for us to have a set of options that then we can try out. And again, whether the Scottish government by itself has enough funding to do the R&D that's necessary, or whether it would be better to pool some of that R&D funding and to undertake that at a, at a more multilateral basis um, is something that could be considered. Thank you. Another question on changing cultural practices uh, within agriculture, particularly when there are voluntary initiatives. And I'd be curious to know how successful you think those have been. For example, the um, Farming for a Better Climate initiative, which is voluntary, um, and yeah, the first phase demonstrated savings in emissions from the focus farms of 10 to 12 per cent, despite challenging weather conditions. Is that replicated when it's voluntary? And how do we encourage greater uptake of voluntary initiatives? 
Well, one of, the, one of the things we've been clearest about, not just in this report, but in, in previous report, is the importance of proper evaluation of these schemes. And so uh, we struggle to know how effective um, Farming for a Better Future is, and indeed the pickup, you know, to what extent has it been picked up outside of the farms that were immediately in, involved in it. So I think better evidence, better evaluation, better tracking and monitoring of programs when they are voluntary is important to then inform whether you can continue with a voluntary approach or whether you have to think about other mechanisms and other incentives and other opportunities to, uh, to roll these out. And one of the things that we've been, we've been clearest about is the importance of that ongoing monitoring and then reacting to what, what is found out. And we, we find a lack of evidence there, not just in Scotland, has to be said, but more generally as well. And, uh, and that's an important, that would be an important first step. And that uh, brings one back to the point about um, baselines, about knowing what you're calculating against. If you're only calculating against the figures from that particular farm, which you very often are, um, you don't have any concept about whether the baseline is a relevant baseline or not. Farms that choose to do these things are very often farms that have always been good at. So is there, are you actually making a bigger... Uh, you can't tell that. So it's... Uh, I, I have to say that um, I actually stopped part of a report, not for Scotland, but of another report we did, because I didn't think that the quality of the baselines in agriculture was sufficiently good for them to be compared with the other parts of the report, that it was better to, not to say we can't answer this question because we really don't have the, 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 the proper statistical base. And so I, I come back to it. I think that getting that statistical base is absolutely essential. And then, of course, you can trace whether the success on individual voluntary uh, arrangements uh, is uh, reduplicated in other farms. Is it moving? Is it actually happening? Do the, does the, do the farmers' unions actually help to do this? Is it really happening? I don't think you can tell that now. I don't think we know. We don't think that we always... Is we come back to the anecdotes. It becomes anecdotal. So... It is a very dull and boring thing, but it has to be done. We have to get those figures right if we are actually going to be able to prove to ourselves what does work. And, and also, it may be that we'll discover that the voluntary system doesn't work. But you need to know that. You can't turn to farmers and say, we're going to make this compulsory because you haven't done it right if you can't prove they haven't done it right. Point on that, on that very issue about mandatory set against voluntary. Um, I mean, as politicians, we're all keenly aware of the, 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 <laughs> the reasons for making something voluntary and the reasons for making it mandatory, which you, you uh, Lord Devon, have, have, have sort of touched on. Um, in our last committee, the Rural Affairs Committee, we looked at the possibility of um, mandatory on-farm carbon audits, and I wonder whether your committee has looked at these and if you see a place for those, taking, bearing in mind what you've already said about one must have evidence um, in order to sort of expect people to do something <laughs> well we we've um, we haven't done all the work that i hope that we will do on on this issue um like anybody else you start with the priorities and we're moving into agriculture now in a way mm -hmm. which we haven't had to do before because we've had to get that first part right and in that sense the the change of the structure in in london from from the just the closeness between energy and climate change to a wider view is, I think, advantageous, as long as it uh, continues in the same direction, every indication that it will. But it's advantageous to say that it, climate change isn't just about energy. It's about a whole range of things. And, and it's going to be very strongly about agriculture. <laughs> um, so we will have to do some more work on that. But again, you've made the point, unless we get the basic measurements right, there is no point in having an audit, because you can only have an audit if your figures are right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark Roscombe. Yeah. Just building on your point there, Lord Devon, obviously your experience in government would be, would be useful to, to share with us here. I mean, how do we achieve that policy coherency? Because we have two sort of separate areas within Scotland. We've got you know, two committees, one rural affairs dealing with agriculture, one environment. We've got two separate ministers. We've got different groups lobbying uh, on either side, if I, if I dare say that, that, there's a side to this debate. So uh, do you see a, a way for us to deliver greater policy coherency here? Because, you know, I, I see that as a real, a real challenge in Scotland, how we can make significant progress in this area. 
Well, I think the convener's uh, introduction to this little bit about uh, land use is the key to this. Uh, I'm just completing an article I'm, I'm doing for a periodical in which I, I'm arguing the case for being much more serious about land use. I just think that we have got to recognise that in these islands, land use is crucial. And if we want to have uh, the sort of responses, we've actually got to be thinking about how you deal with rural land, how you deal with urban land, how you deal with forest, all those things together. And uh, it isn't for me to say how your committees should work, but I do think one of the problems of the vociferation of committees is that that concept of thinking about land use, bringing, see, it's planning into that. Why, why is planning not involved in both the environment and, and agriculture? Because that's all part of the same picture. And if we're going to deal with, uh, not just with flooding, but what happens with very heavy, much more heavy rain coming down in much more concentrated bouts on the west side of Scotland, if we're going to deal and think about what that means to the countryside and to um, uh, the way in which we protect ourselves as well as make use of it, then you can only do that if you're thinking about um, land use in the, whole, in the whole. And I think we've been very slow to understand that. So that's, that's my key, is to mm -hmm. think about land use together. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that. I want to move on to the issue of housing, uh, Alexander Burnett. <coughs> thank you. Uh, just before I ask my question, I'd refer to my register of interest, and in, interest in house building and, and uh, the rented sector. Um, we obviously want to uh, you know, see improvements in, in housing and the housing standards and energy efficiency and, and the EPC uh, question of, uh, of how you monitor and uh, monitor buildings. Um, there's, there's been considerable discrepancy in, in the, stand, the, uh, the quality of EPCs. You can get uh, varying results depending on which firms you use and there seems to be a lack of uh, consistency uh, in the standard. Um, as these standards, which I think are a very good thing, we can become more and more important and have more and more financial implications, uh, whether it's uh, the level of feed-in tariff or RHI you can qualify for, or whether your the ability to uh, to let a property. Uh, what, what, what's your view on this, and how do you see, and how important, and, and who do you think should be taking the lead in getting uh, more consistent EPC standards? Well, I first of all think it's very important indeed. Um, I do think that. It uh, continues to be uh, not good that we are still building houses which we're going to have to retrofit because we're just not building them to a standard which other countries would automatically build them. And, and uh, I also happen to think, and it's a, something I have some expertise in, uh, I think the arguments that this can't be done because it's so much more expensive are just nonsense. The truth is that the only reason that it's more expensive is because we don't do enough of it and therefore you don't get the same long runs which you do uh, at the, using less efficient systems. And we just have to realise that. This is, this is like offshore wind. When you start, it's very expensive indeed. It's only when they actually start having having a proper order book and they can have bigger boats and they can do all sorts of things which they couldn't do before, that you begin to see the, the, the price fall very significantly. And uh, if government doesn't set high standards and insist on them and not change the date, but actually insists upon this, the industry won't make the changes that it needs to make. And what's more, the good companies will suffer because the people who think they can get away with it will get away with it, and that you don't want to have. I think it's very bad for morale and also morally unacceptable. So uh, I, I take it very seriously, and I think, and, and the argument I'm least like are the people who say, oh, well, it's only a tiny bit, you know. You have to understand, Lord Deben, that most of the houses we've got are already built, and that's what we've got to concentrate on. Well. Yeah, that's true, but it doesn't mean to say you make the, the thing worse by not getting the ones you are building to the standard that you're going to, we hope, change the others to. So I think you're right, absolutely central. The time's against us, so I want to move yeah. on uh, and look at waste. Uh, Morris Golden. Hi, I'm 
really just one focus question around your recommendation for encouraging recycle, recycling and separate food waste collections in rural island and island communities. Obviously, um, generally when you're uh, introducing a new service, you do some rerouting to fa financially mitigate uh, the, the impact of a, a new service. Now, in rural and island communities, obviously the addition of that new service, given the economies of scale, are, are significantly less for, for local authorities there. So I wondered what your thoughts were on how you would actually fulfil that recommendation of encouraging uh, those systems in those particular areas. It isn't easy. Um, and I wouldn't pretend it's easy. And I'm not sure that you, can't, you can do it without accepting that it will be more expensive to do it in those areas than elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I still have a feeling like the penny post. I do actually think that you, you, you must provide services uh, in rural areas uh, in so far as you can, which are commensurate with, else, mm -hmm. with elsewhere. In many of those rural areas, of course, people are able to do a lot of their own composting. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'm very keen on doing is perhaps spending the money uh, that you do have to, to get those who are not doing it to understand how to do it and certainly to provide mm -hmm. the preliminary equipment which will make that possible for many. So there are a number of ways of doing it. And I think I particularly think that way down is the best. It's certainly the one that we found in my very rural area where I live. Um, certainly, but it's nothing like as difficult as you've got on the islands. Okay, right. thanks. A short, sharp question from Claudia Beamish around business, industrial and the public sectors. Right, thank you, Kavina. I think you've almost asked the question, actually. <laughs> um, it's really uh, to you both what opportunities exist uh, in Scotland in devolved areas for in relation to the public sector, industry and business. And as, as you will know, um, we moved towards mandatory reporting in the public sector after a complex range of... Uh, discussions in the in the previous session of the Parliament. So I wonder if you have comments on any of those sectors, please. Well, I'd, all I'd say is that I'm, I'm very much in favour of reporting, as long as somebody then reads the reports and makes sure that what they've reported has a result in changing attitudes and improvements. Mm -hmm. I, I'm terribly concerned about the amount of reporting that goes on to no good purpose at all except reporting. And uh, I think you've got a wonderful opportunity here of actually making people feel that when they report, my goodness, somebody looks at it and says, what about this? And well done. Very important part of it. Well done when they've done it well. Saying thank you is, to me, one of the cheapest and most important things for us all to learn. So that might indeed be an appropriate note for our own committee to <laughs> get, get those back who are doing mandatory reporting and, and uh, listen to where things are going and hopefully say thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We move on to RPP3 and I want to explore how you feel RPP3 can build on RPP2, what the implications yeah. of the Paris Agreement are on the development of RPP3. And just about the whole issue that you touch upon in your report about having proper monitoring of progress in place. So, I mean, that's, a, that's a good place to, uh, to start off because one of the things that we're, uh, we recommended most strongly is that the next, the next RPP, the Climate Change Plan, sets out clear, measurable sets of, uh, of objectives against which progress can be met and made and measured in each of these sectors. And so whether it's areas we've been talking about in transport or in buildings or in agriculture or indeed continued progress on the, on the electricity and power fronts, is that it's not simply a collection of policies or a collection of good ideas, but it is also a program against which you can evaluate progress and against which you can make adjustments because um, we know that there'll be learning that takes place as you go along and where you set off might not be where you end up but it's important to have the information we were just talking about monitoring of, of public buildings but more generally in these schemes and so um, as we've indicated sort of in response to some of the other questions it's often not our position to say this is the precise policy that should go into RPP3, um, but it is important that there, in each of these sectors that we've discussed, there's a range of policies that you're trialing different things, that things are being put in in a meaningful way, 
district heating schemes are being put in in a meaningful way. Meaningful effort is being made on modal shift and on electric vehicles. Meaningful effort is being made in agriculture. And that the monitoring is taking place such that we can make adjustments over time because these are medium-term plans. Okay. And it's crucial for the public because if people don't believe that these things are really happening, or they think someone else isn't doing it and they're doing it, or this country isn't doing it and that country is, is, uh, isn't doing it, then you have a very, very bad effect. I had a comment last night, somebody saying, oh, well, we're doing it all and France and Germany aren't doing it. It's absolutely untrue, as a matter of fact. But the point is, you do need those figures um, if people are to continue to work hard. Okay, and the impact of the Paris Agreement? Well, for me, it's the most important agreement that we possibly could have because what it has told the world is that that is the direction we're moving in. Now, it may be that we are going to find some difficulty in keeping up with it and we've got to pressurise all the time and, and, of course, some people have promised what they won't deliver and other people will deliver more than they promised. The Chinese, in my view, will deliver more than they promised because that's their mechanism of thinking. They will, but, but others will not do that. They've just signed up because they've got to sign up. That's so. But the fact is... Nobody now can doubt the direction in which we're, we're, we're moving and what we're intending to do. And, and Paris is crucial to that. And after all, it is, we shouldn't underestimate what it is. It's no, never before in the history of mankind have the, all the nations, in effect, of the world come together voluntarily and agreed something as extensive as this. It is a staggering fact and I think it's changed the world. Okay. Um, you've referenced on a number of occasions this morning that it's not your role to tell government what to do, but you do make recommendations. And you've given the government two options around the annual emissions targets to 2032. Could you briefly outline the merits and demerits of each of those options? That's what I've got a chief executive for. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, it's worth saying that the, uh, the, the difference between the two options is not huge, and so you, you end up in, in broadly similar places, and particularly um, all the uncertainty that we've just been talking about around agriculture and other areas. Uh, given that uncertainty, you probably end up in very similar places. But the, the two options that we've presented, the first option recognizes the fact that since the annual targets were set out to 2027, they're set a number of years ago now, we have new evidence and we have new facts. And were we in a world where nothing is changing, that new evidence and those new facts would suggest that you change your annual targets out to 2027, as well as setting the new targets that have to be set from 2028 to 2032. We recognize that the reality is we're not in a world where everything's standing still. And in particular, one of the proposals that the government has is to bring forward the new Climate Change Act. And if that new Climate Change Act is going to result in a whole set of, uh, of new targets, then it might be superfluous to try to go through the legislative process now of changing all the targets between now and 2027, when you know that in a year's time you're going to have a new Climate Change Act that will do that. And so effectively, that's the difference between our two proposals. It's clear that you have to set new annual targets from 2028 to 2032 by the 31st of October. Whether you decide to amend the targets before 2028, I think is a judgment about will the new Climate Change Act come in quickly enough and be meaningful and provide the direction that everybody needs in order to, uh, in order to make that additional legislative process superfluous. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, I know you have another meeting to attend in Edinburgh. Can I thank you on behalf of the committee uh, for a fascinating morning's evidence. Uh, no doubt we'll continue to engage with you in the years going forward. So uh, thank you very much. I'm now going to suspend for five minutes before the next session takes place. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.
The fourth item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence from the Scottish Parliament on its work uh, in combating climate change. As a public sector body, the Parliament is required to both follow the duties as set out in the 2009 Climate Change Act and report on its work to reduce its carbon footprint. We're joined this morning by Sir Paul Grice, the Scottish Parliament's Chief Executive, and Victoria Barbie, the Parliament's Environmental Manager. Welcome to you both. Members have a series of questions for you. Uh, can I begin just with a, a scene setter? How would you characterise the Scottish Parliament's performance in these areas to date? Uh, I think we're very pleased with what we've uh, achieved since we, we set out on this uh, road a number of years ago with strong support from the corporate body and the Parliament more widely. So with a few um, exceptions, for example, just undershooting on things like uh, waste, I think we've hit all the targets we've set. I think the key point is we're right on track for hitting the 42% reduction in our carbon footprint by, by 2020. So uh, always a, a bit anxious and nervous about sounding sort of complacent, but I think we're, we're pleased with where we've got to so far and uh, but keen, I think, to kick on from here. Could I ask then um, what would have been the biggest challenges you've faced to date in trying to hit those targets? And also, have you any examples of innovative uh, working that's that's helped get the progress you have to date? Yeah, the um, I mean, electricity consumption is, is really dominates in terms of carbon footprint. And that's been, there's not been one single thing, but that, that's a big area for us. So that's required um, both investment in technology, such as LED lighting, but also behavior change, just persuading us all to remember to switch things off and, and, and that kind of thing. So that, that has been an area for challenge. I think waste has been a, a particular challenge, though you know, the numbers are impressive, I think. You know, we've, I think we've achieved a 72% reduction. Uh, we're aiming at 90. Um, and again, I think the thing about waste is a lot of behavior. What we're trying to do is reduce what we use in the first place, um, and we're all uh, you know, that, that's about the way a lot of us behave, and that's always a, a, a challenge. Though, again, I have to say, I've had tremendous support over the years from members and staff alike, but nonetheless, that, that I think, is a challenge uh, for us going forward. So th th I think they've been the two big areas, and inevitably, when you set out on a programme like this, uh, you do the, the stuff with the highest returns first. Um, and, for example, I remember when we put LED lighting in the car park, I mean, you know, the payback on that was maybe a couple of years. I mean, and, but as you go forward, you have to look for more and more challenging uh, opportunities. So that, I think that's really uh, uh, what have been the two biggest challenges. And I think we'll continue to be the two biggest challenges as we go forward. On the subject of energy consumption and lighting, it's long been a bugbear of mine that parliamentary committees sit during the daytime in rooms with lighting of this nature, blinds drawn, we're told, I think, largely to accommodate television coverage. Is that something Parliament's started to look at? Because, to be blunt, television technology will have moved on. Is there not opportunity to use cameras that are better in terms of, of, of coping with lighting sources? Because surely you would appreciate this doesn't look good. I've got a light in my eye as we speak. Well, I mean, we have put LED lighting in, so that, I mean, that obviously has, has reduced it. I, it. It's a tension that um, we've, we've had throughout. The, you're right, at one level, both the committee rooms and the chamber are essentially like broadcast studios, and by far the largest number of people who view your work as parliamentarians, which is vitally important, will view through webcasting and, and, and on the TV, and we need, you know, we need um, to get the best uh, quality uh, for that. And there is a tension, um, more so in some other rooms even than this, with a lot of, uh, you know yourself, in the, in the, in the chamber um, is, is a challenge. And I, I just try and strike a balance between, between the two. Um, as we put new cameras in, you're right, they're able to work with lower light levels. But the reality is, if you're a pure broadcaster, you prefer, they just like blacked out rooms. Um, whereas, obviously, we try and sort of strike a balance. I, I think as we go forward, and eventually, uh, we'll no doubt have to replace the lighting more than just putting LED in. And again, we'll look at all of that at the time. So um, I can't offer you, I'm afraid, an immediate solution, but it is something we try and balance. And certainly, I think putting LED lighting in at least has reduced the energy consumption of the lights we do use. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Moving on to reporting procedures, Claudia Beamish. Vina and uh, good morning to you, um, Victoria, and good morning again to you, um, Paul. Um, you have a carbon management plan 
which, as, as you know, of course, covers buildings, travel, decision-making, and indirect greenhouse gas emissions. Um, could you comment on when it was last uh, reviewed and uh, any other comments that you have about that um, carbon plan that's in place? Yeah, it's been in place, I think, for about five years, five years now. We review it annually. So, and and we, uh, the other thing we do is we take external advice. For example, the Carbon Trust were enormously helpful um, in when we, set, when we set it up. But there are organisations like Zero Waste Scotland and others. So what we, and uh, sparing Victoria's blushes, you know, we've, uh, both Victoria and her predecessor, David Fairhurst, you know, we've always felt it was right to have a, a technical expert on, on the staff to, to guide us. So we keep reviewing it um, annually. It's the, as you, I think, neatly described, it's the carbon plan w which actually brings it all together for us and I think that will just be continue whether there's a need for a, a complete revision of it uh, going forward I don't know I think at the moment um, so long as we're still uh, on track to achieve the targets I think uh, we'll just continue with the annual update clearly once we get closer to 2020 to my mind I think there's probably a case for standing right back and maybe starting starting again just to make sure that we've not we're not missing uh, new issues that we might want to address can I Yes, of course. Can I just add, we've also um, applied for the Carbon Trust triple standard. So um, that will give us uh, good verified data that we are meeting our plan and checks that we've, we've, we're talking about the right data and that they've verified it all correctly. So, Right, thank you. And just, just building on that question, um, how has the Parliament found the experience of fulfilling the reporting requirements of the climate change um, duties for public body, bodies reporting requirements? Uh, and uh, just touching back on the previous question, have you been able to share what is obviously quite a lot of good practice um, with other organisations in the public sector? And on, on your first point, uh, as the committee may know, we volunteered to go a year early um, on that with the government. And we found it a very, a very satisfactory, actually, rather good progress. So I think we, we, we find it's a good discipline on us. So um, I, certainly I can speak from this organisation. We're very happy with that. And now, of course, we're into the formal process and it's good that we've had that that year I think in terms of uh, yes we do I mean Victoria networks a lot with other organizations I've certainly spoken uh, publicly on uh, when I've been invited uh, about what we've done both what we've achieved but it's also I think also important to share challenges um, and that's I think been very well received I think as a high profile public body people are always interested in in what we do and I was interested I was listening into some of your previous evidence and I would absolutely underline the points I think the convener and others have made you've got to have the data you know you, you persuade people by having good information you persuade people I think by being candid about not just your achievements but where the challenges lie and I think that's the approach we've we've tried to do and we're always very happy to to share experience with other not just public sector but public and private sector uh, third sector organizations Right, thank you. Just to follow that up uh, briefly, could I ask whether the um, reporting mechanisms, um, whether you found them, I know it's early days in terms of the mandatory reporting, but have they been comparable with other organisations? Uh, I'm going to let Victoria answer that. Yeah, I think it's really helpful that it's now an online system so we can enter the data in directly. That's been really helpful and the data is pulled through from the previous year's submission. So again, that saves my time adding in all the, the different data. It's really good we can use the, the Carbon Trust standards as part of the verification of that data as well so we're not duplicating by having other additional verification from other organisations. So that's really helpful. I do find that because the, the tool, the template, is designed to cover all different public sector organisations, sometimes our data doesn't quite fit and we can't quite answer as many of the questions as we'd like to if we were a bigger public sector organisation. Um, but it, it is designed to cover everybody, so we can kind of accept that, that oh, issue. Thank you. And lastly, have you done any, um, or are you considering any peer um, review assessment? Um, in relation to the mandatory targets? No, not this year. It might be something that we do in following years, um, but we, because we've used the, the Carbon Trust uh, standard, that's probably greater than it would be if it was a peer review. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you. You touched there upon um, sharing best practice with other organisations. Has there been any uh, work done on collaborative working, physical collaborative working with neighbours, perhaps around district heating, that sort of thing? A really interesting uh, idea. I think uh, um, 
that is something that's on you know a future a future plan i think our approach there would be to work with the city of edinburgh council and there uh, have or are just about to set up i think uh, one of these you know companies within the council to promote that um, we would certainly be interested in that it's obviously a long term plan but district teaching is obviously something that's been on our radar for quite some time it wouldn't be something we would we're not a big enough institution to lead on but um, if there's a uh, interest in a scheme being developed by the council we would certainly be want to be part of the discussions on that then it would just come down to uh, you know what the business case was but in, in principle that's something i'm very interested in uh, and other areas of collaboration again i think you'd say principally with the city of edinburgh council around transport and other issues we work very closely with them in terms of getting people to and from the building so yeah i think collaboration with our neighbors is is key okay, we'll come on to transport and mark roscoe yeah, you're, you're happy? Yeah. Okay, you're happy with that? Okay. Uh, let's move on to procurement. Uh, Morris Golden. Uh, hi, both. Um, firstly, I should uh, declare an interest in that I've worked with the Scottish Parliament previously in my role at Zero Waste Scotland with respect to the Parliament becoming a flagship Zero Waste Zone and most recently supporting the sustainable uh, procurement uh, work. Um, so I think it would be helpful, first of all, uh, to give an overview of your sustainable uh, procurement uh, vision for the Parliament, but specifically I'd like to um, ask you about how the procurement strategy can um, open up to include um, disruptive or circular economy businesses, which tend to be small, which tend to be micro businesses, which tend to get left out of uh, procurement because they're inevitably um, uh, be deemed a higher risk to those uh, doing the procurement. So, for example, uh, you know, there's, there's micro businesses out there that offer a lighting service, which we've, we've mentioned in terms of LEDs, which would uh, ensure that the product of the LEDs wasn't owned by the Scottish Parliament anymore, but by a, a micro business. So in terms of integrating those sort of procurements into your sustainable procurement strategy would be something that I'd, I'd like to hear more about. Uh, maybe invite uh, Victoria in. Um, so the first point is we, we see procurement obviously as a central part of our approach. So it's, it's, it's integrated into it. The, underpinning approach is our responsible procurement strategy which dates back to about 2009 more recently uh, we have a sort of sustainable procurement matrix which we work on which really guides us through any and and starts on any procurement by asking do you need to buy it i mean it's it's a bit like the reduce mm -hmm. uh, reuse recycles the first thing to ask yourself is do you need it at all um, so that's embedded right from the beginning of the procurement process. But assuming you get through to the, the, uh, the actual point of procurement, there's all sorts of guidance along the way. Um, alongside that, one of the things that we've found very helpful, I think, to address uh, your point um, about uh, uh, smaller organisations is we've run these really successful Meet the Buyer events. We find one of the uh, big challenges for smaller businesses is just being aware of procurement mm -hmm. opportunities. Um, they don't necessarily have whole departments that bigger companies would have looking out for those. Um, so I think we've also, so that's, they've been very, and we'll continue with those. And again, if, if, if members here have got particular businesses or others who are not finding they're engaging with that, it's really good feedback to have with us because we, you know, what we do there is we bring them in and informally because, the, as you know, the procurement process gets rather formal rather quickly and that's not something we can really change so what we try to do is have these informal front ends so they can come in informally discuss with either for say facilities management colleagues or procurement colleagues and often give them guidance on how best to pitch for the business we do and we can listen to them it may and there's a critical issue which is not easy to resolve is how you package them up i mean there's a drive obviously always to get better value for money as an accountable officer i have to do that and sometimes you do just get economies on the other hand, we absolutely committed to try to give as many, especially small and medium enterprises, an opportunity. And that there's just a balance to strike in there. So there's decisions for us to make structurally. A lot we can do to encourage uh, um, businesses to get involved in that process. And I think we're finding the, the procurement matrix, which is, I think, a sort of government tool, a really helpful discipline on us to help us sort of step through. And it also 
tackles things like living wage and others that are mm -hmm. off the back of the uh, Procurement Act 2014. So that's our, our basic approach, but Victoria might want to add a bit more to that. Just, just to add, we are looking at um, adopting a more circular economy approach on certain contracts. So the audio-visual contract mm -hmm. um, is a, a hiring in system mm -hmm. rather than purchasing it, and something that we're going to look at for our furniture contract as well, whether we can hire furniture rather mm -hmm. than purchase it and then just discard it. Uh, I was also going to add that for the first time in our annual report, we've started to measure some of the environment um, impacts that our uh, supply chain are bringing into the, the parliament and trying to measure how, we're, how they're helping us to reduce our environment impact. And hopefully we can do a bit more of that and perhaps even start considering scope three emissions from procurement and, and start measuring that as well. Um, right, moving on to adaptation and resilience, Alexander Burnett. Uh, really, a couple of questions about uh, the planning process when you're making decisions. Um, firstly, with, with climate change, what sort of evidence are you seeing for changing patterns over the last sort of five years or so with the strategy and how you can uh, take into account future uh, patterns, whether it's more recent demands maybe on air conditioning or uh, winter uh, demands and people getting into travel? Uh, and a second more general question on, on sort of cost-benefit analysis. Uh, what, how do you, how do you, what budget allocation do you have for this, and how, what, where do you, do you have a limit of value for money? Is it about achieving these targets at all costs, or uh, maybe offsetting elsewhere? I'll maybe take the last one first and uh, in, invite uh, Vic, Victoria in. Um, we always do cost-benefit analysis on any investment, um, and uh, yes, there is a, there's a fixed amount of, of money, so it can never be at any cost. Um, and I referred earlier, I mean, the phrase people often ban about was the so-called low-hanging fruit, but um, more particularly, obviously you want to do the things which deliver the greatest benefits, but inevitably, and we, because we began this early and we've been, I think, I hope very energetic and vigorous in our approach, we've got through a lot of, a lot of that. So you start to get into, for example, if you're looking at um, self-generation of electricity. Um, you'll know, this committee will know better than I do, you know, the returns on, for example, you know, photoelectric cells tends to be longer than, say, putting LED lighting in the garage. And I think what the way I look at it is that, that I think you need a mix. Um, and I think also, so, you know, the, our, so our investment programme in environmental um, measures will have a mix. There'll be some things which will have a very rapid return, but I, I'm very keen subject to persuading the corporate body um, that, you know, some things we just have to accept will have a longer payback. And that's partly because if we go into hit long-term targets, we need to make that investment. And partly I'm conscious as the parliament, I think we have a, a leadership role and, and, you know, it's still public money. We have to be thoughtful, but I think sometimes, you know, we need to be bold to demonstrate that it can be done. So you'll find a mix. Um, and, and at the end of the day, of course, it is driven by just what money we have available and, uh, um, there's certainly more we would do, but we're just like every other organisation, we have to live within our means. But I'm very keen. We also, for example, have a 25-year maintenance plan that helps us look past the normal planning horizon, and the idea is just to try to constantly be looking ahead to what's necessary, what's affordable. And one thing that's helped us, I guess, is technology itself has, has changed. Often things come down in cost um, or div deliver greater effectiveness, and again, Lighting is an area that you'll know has changed out of all recognition over a very short period of time. So, you know, there's that it's a constant process of, sort of revisiting that. And we have just a portfolio of investment. And I have a structure within the organization of my colleagues led by David McGill, who's sitting in the, uh, in the seats of there. So David has the responsibility across the organization for managing that, that process. So we always have a pipeline of projects coming forward. Do you want to sort of pick up the first question? Yeah, so um, about climate change adaptation, um, we have had the, the, the training um, by Adaptation Scotland. Our Sustainable and Environment Strategy Board received the initial training about adaptation. And then we're going to move through onto the, the next stages of the um, steps to managing climate risks, which is set out in the guide for public bodies in Scotland and we'll work through that and produce a climate change adaptation plan for the Parliament. Um, we also include in our procurement process there is sections in there about adaptation and about encouraging um, contractors and suppliers to make sure that they're building in adaptation plans into their procurement process.
Can I ask in terms of, of, of um, resilience planning for significant events, have you had any engagement with the National Resilience Centre at all? Um, yes, I mean, we, we, we have a, um, a well-developed resilience planning process anyway, and we feel this just fits naturally with that. Um, we work closely with the government, for example, and certainly with the emergency services and others to learn lessons, and we're, we're conscious that a lot of the expertise uh, that's sitting out there and we do, you know, for example, we run exercises from time to time as well. So I think that fits well into, you know, planning for other potential eventualities that could disrupt the business here. Um, and, you know, again, some technological changes, for example, one of the greatest vulnerabilities is potentially, you know, water ingress. If you've got servers, most organisations put the servers in the basement because it makes sense, but it's obviously a vulnerable area in terms of resilience. Again, I heard some of the earlier evidence you had about you know greater um, uh, more concentrated rainfall um, but there so there again you know, we're looking for example at having more data stored in, uh, in the cloud which gives us there's a lot of benefits to that but one of the key ones is it gives you more resilience um, so that so that, that's our uh, and that I think will just be continued to our approach going forward okay thank you for that I think we want to move on to transport and a number of members have um, questions around this uh, starting with uh, Dave Stewart Thank you, Sir Paul and uh, Victoria. You probably have gathered from the previous evidence session that transport is a major source of emissions in Scotland. It's around 28% mm. uh, of emissions. I mean, do you have a system within the Parliament for assessing the uh, costs of climate emissions associated with staff commuting patterns? And if so, what is it you're doing to try and reduce emissions? Yeah, so there, I mean, there are, there are t two aspects to, to this. Uh, there is the, you know, the, the commuting, you like, to and from the place of work, and there's business travel. Uh, which I guess is mostly uh, when um, committees and others uh, uh, go out. I think on the, the committee trial and others, we have a well-established system now, I think, and you'll probably have known this yourselves when you've gone out to take evidence sessions that, you know, the clerks will support you in considering the most effective way, including environmental considerations. I think that's become a well-established uh, methodology. In terms of commuting, people commuting to and from work, this is a more recent addition, if you like, into our strategy. When we first began, I think we, we felt we should start with the things we can control within the building. But, uh, and I, Victoria will correct me if I'm wrong, but this is where you're getting more into scope three and sort of indirect issues. And you're into a number of issues there. A lot of it's about behavior. Um, it's not for me as the chief executive to dictate how people get to and from the workplace. I mean, that's actually done in their own time. So what you've got to do is to um, persuade them and, and I th hopefully lead by example in how we do that. So we, we've done a number of things. First and foremost, uh, I think provided excellent facilities and recently upgraded facilities for people who want to cycle or walk or run or get here in a way that requires changing uh, facilities. Um, we've also done, and a lot of things I've benefited myself recently, uh, uh, sort of guided cycles into work. You know, and I, uh, having thought I knew Edinburgh well, I discovered cycle paths I didn't know existed. And uh, Victoria was telling me the other day, we're going to try that with walking um, to work. And we're wrapping that in a general plan that also includes, uh, you know, encouraging and helping people to better understand the public transport, uh, working with the City of Edinburgh Council. So I think, it, you know, in, in terms that it's about, to my mind, it's about providing good choices for people, not dictating to them, um, but encouraging them, helping them be aware, but actually making it an attractive and easy option. Um, and it also ties in with some of the healthy living initiatives that we're looking at. And that would, uh, and there's plenty of organisations out there. We were, we took part in a, a competition last year, I think it was, about cycling to work. Um, and I'm pleased to say we came top. I think we got 15% of colleagues cycling. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a range of persuasion and encouragement and providing good facilities. Um, and I think we're doing pretty well, but, you know, I think it's like any behavioral change. I think it will just be a continuous mm. process of, of working, uh, of working mm. with that. But so far, I'm, I'm encouraged um, uh, with the results we've had. Mm. And I know from my own experience that you've had a strong home working policy. Presumably that's helped quite dramatically in reducing emissions. Yeah, I think fle flexible working, um, uh, use of technology again, um, you know, video conferencing, you know, the, these you know, like iPads. Um, I mean, flexible working, I think, has huge benefits uh, more broadly to the organisation in terms of um, effectiveness and, and morale. But you're right. Um, it also ties back into the convener's point about resilience. One of the key bits of resilience 
planning is actually people not being able to get to work um, and because of the transport disruption. And if you have a flexible uh, policy around where people can work from, actually that gives you, uh, gives you resilience. So you get benefits, I think, on, on all sides of that. I can bring you on to aviation. Again, this is obviously a major source of emissions. Within the UK, um, do you have a policy for staff uh, travel in terms of uh, flying where there is um, solid available rail alternatives open? I think we encourage it. Again, it's, it's hard to be, you can't dictate. So, for example, if I'm down in London, I'm a great fan of the sleeper, so, you know, it, it doesn't suit everybody. Um, training it both ways in a day, up and down, that's a lot of travel in a day. So I think we encourage people to use it where there's, a, where there's an alternative, which would principally be train. But I, I don't think we're at the point of telling people there's only one way um, they can do it. But certainly it would be our um, preferred option that people look first and foremost at, you know, uh, travel by public transport, uh, certainly within the UK. I just think, uh, I don't, I'm not myself persuaded that we go the step saying you must, mm. you must do it. I mean, the first question is, do you need to go at all? So as with all these things, do you need to make that journey? But if you do need to mm. make that journey, what's the best transport option? Mm. Uh, we'd expect them to go by, you know, by bus or mm. train ideally. Mm. But if they need to fly because the time frame is such that there is no other way to do it, mm. Mm. Then fine. One thing I would say is just in cost terms, sadly, still it's often the cheapest financial mm. uh, position. I mean, mm. I, we've got better, at, you know, by long advance booking, but um, sadly still, you know, as I say, even on the sleeper, which I think is a great mm. way to get to London, it's still right. pretty pricey, you know, mm. and uh, against a sort of easy jet mm. flight down in the morning. It's, so you have to... What I've tried to do is encourage staff to think I'll support that. You know, I mean, I'm mm. not. You know, they. You know, we, we will we will meet that cost. Mm. So I think there's a providing such services. <laughs> 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 well, on the point of is the journey necessary? I mean, how important is video conferencing uh, within the Parliament? Clearly, the committees yeah. are geared up to that, and that's an issue about reducing the opportunity for witnesses coming in because we can use video conferencing. Yeah. How important is that for your own staff? It is, and it's great to be sitting in this room, which is the sort of premier um, video conference suite for committees, and I don't know if you've had a chance to use it, but we've recently relocated our video, the other video conference suite from the Ministerial Tower into Queensbury House. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, I, I personally use it quite, quite a lot, find it a very good way to, um, you know, have discussions and, and, and business. Maybe there's more we could do uh, with that. I mean, it's the nature of a parliament, it's actually a lot of people tend to come to us, a lot of people want to come here, um, and so it's striking a balance. I mean, that personal engagement is still important. But again, the first question is always, yeah, do I need to make that journey? And video conference technology now is well established. We'll all remember the days a few years ago where, you know, you were losing signal and breakdown. I think now it's pretty robust. And we've certainly invested very heavily in, in having good uh, video conference facilities. So I, I would apply exactly the same policy as you would expect as a committee member to ask, is it necessary? to do that journey. If it is, and there's lots of good reasons often for having that face-to-face -face contact, fine. If not, I think we've got good facilities uh, throughout the Parliament to use that. And all the digital meeting rooms, of course, now have that integrated in them as well. With respect, that, that's fine for that type of video conferencing, but parliamentary committees generate a lot of travel miles with the witnesses. Um, do we do any kind of assessment on the travel patterns of the, the many, many witnesses that come to parliamentary committees. And bearing that in mind, can we not do more around providing video conferencing facilities within committee rooms for the parliamentary committees to make use of those during sessions? I'll take that away and I'll happily have a look at that convener to see whether, and I'd need to talk to the clerks who, who, who sort of organise that to see if there's more we could do. I mean, so we have, in terms of facilities committees, I mean, this room is the permanently adapted room. Mm -hmm. And we also have some mobile facilities. Uh, and if there's any evidence um, that committees have been frustrated in wanting to use it for lack of equipment, then I'll very happily take that away. Um, you know, so say, at the moment, my, my sense is it meets demand. But if that's not the case, then I, I wouldn't want a committee ever to feel if people were having to travel to it who would prefer to use video conferencing because we didn't have enough facilities here. So I'd be happy to take that point yeah, away. Yeah, because is it not really about changing mindsets 
that, that there will always be people who want to come to Parliament yeah. to give their evidence. It's perfectly understandable. But if we were to be more proactive in pushing the option of doing video conferencing, where appropriate, mm. because you couldn't, clearly couldn't have eight witnesses feeding into a committee at the same time. But I just think, especially we are the Environment Committee, we yeah. welcome you to have some thought around that yeah. issue for going forward. I think it's a really good point, and I'll, I'll happily take that away if I may, and I'll, I'll, I'll write back to you uh, when I've had a, had a look at that. That would yeah. be appreciated. Uh, further questions around transport, Kate Forbes, and then Emma Harper. Morning. Can I add to that previous comment about video conferencing and ask what you do around constituency offices, if, if anything, to encourage the same good practice that you're promoting in the Parliament building? Question one and second question in terms of video conferencing as well. I, you know, Skype for Business has been great. And um, when there are bigger groups meeting, say in constituency offices and and um, trying to meet with other MSPs elsewhere, for example, in the Highlands, yeah. what kind of uh, facilities might there be to facilitate video conferencing in constituency offices? Um, again, I think if I may, rather than sort of give you half an answer on that, I think it's a really interesting point. I think the answer is some of the basic equipment we give members would support a degree of video conferencing. But why don't I, I'd rather take that, I think it's a really interesting line of thought, and I'd rather take it away, and I'll come back to you with what we currently have, but also take up your very fair questions, what more we might do um, to encourage members, especially members, yeah, living in, in dispersed areas to allow them to communicate. So if, if I may, can I take that one away and I'll, I'll come back to you, not just with what we're doing, but what we might do um, over the next, over this session. It's video conferencing again, actually. Okay. Um, uh, the other committee I'm on are really not keen on it as, at all. So I'm just wondering if, if it would be worth exploring like a, a way to educate members that how far advanced video conferencing has come. It works great for the NHS. Um, you know, reduces miles, but um, it might help some of our members if they had a, a wee demonstration of how it wor well it works. Look, I'll tell you, I mean, without being cheeky, you're always in a great position to, to, to reassure them member to member. Um, but I think that's a good point. I think a lot of folk are still stuck in what video conferencing was like 10 years ago, you know, with, with you know, poor bandwidth and, and you know, and I, and, I think, and I think you're right, a lot of people probably got frustrated with it and have not gone back to it. Um, and again, what I'll do specifically on that is I'll, I'll talk to all the lead committee clerks who I think are obviously, I think, the way into this. And, and I do take your point. I mean, maybe just get people to try it and realise that it actually... You're right. I mean, convenient mate's point, I, I've, try, I've sometimes been on a video session with six or seven people. And it, there reaches a point where I think it just becomes impossible. But particularly just when you're talking to one or two people, it's a very good way of doing it. And you're right. I think maybe a lot of people have... A, preconceptions about it that and I think your idea of a demonstration is an excellent one but you know and just you know t speaking to your colleagues and encouraging them that it that it works but I'll, I'll pick that up with the committee clerks um, and suggest that they specifically make that offer to all committees and if they're skeptical maybe to invite them just to have a go uh, perhaps not in a formal session with a witness where they might be a bit nervous about it not working but it can be done um, e e even uh, the point Kate Forbes made about you know when you get used to video conferencing each other as members, when it's a bit more of a relaxed environment, you maybe build up the confidence. I think a lot of it is they're just worried that it'll break. Uh, and, you know, and, and I think we've got to just try and uh, reassure people that um, you know, it's not perfect. And there's always a bit of a risk with technology, but it's moved on a long way. So if I, I'll take that forward specifically, I think, with the committee clerks and get them to um, encourage committees. And we can't make them, but encourage committees to, to have a go. Up on that, um, it's not just committees, it's also um, that there, there's an issue with cross-party groups. Now, I'm aware that uh, the, the support um, for cross-party groups isn't provided directly by the Scottish Parliament. However, um, there was an issue with uh, the CPG and crofting in the last session um, and the request for video conference, conferencing facilities. Now, clearly, uh, the CPG and crofting and the CPG on Gaelic, um, by their nature, uh, rely on people to travel from the Western Highlands and, and the Northwestern Highlands and the, um, the Western Isles. So while it's not um, at the moment a direct responsibility for the Parliament to provide these facilities, is it something that can be looked at in the future to, to help uh, people who, who, while they might well want to travel to Edinburgh from, from 
Stornoway, for example, uh, they may appreciate video conference, conferencing facilities. I understand the problem. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a very important principle around cross-party groups, which is to keep them exactly as they are, informal groups. And not If we make them part of the parliament, we make them a different thing. And, so, um, and there are very clear rules um, set by the Standards Committee around that, and I have to operate very carefully within those. Um, and, I, and even without those, I would be personally very reluctant to lose the essence of them, which are they are not formal committees of the parliament, and I think we need to be very careful. But what we will do, it's not that we'll give them no support. So, for example, we will set up a video conference facility. What we won't do, uh, and it's also a resource issue, is have uh, broadcast staff on hand into the evening. So we will happily, especially, and I think there's, sometimes we can perhaps improve the communication between Parliament staff and, and the cross-party group. Um, so if we know there's going to be a cross-party group, say it was meeting in here at sort of 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock tonight, we will come in and get that set up, and we're happy to provide that support. <coughs> I think what we can't do is then have, you know, as you would have if you were meeting, all the sort of technical support um, on hand. So I hope that's a sort of a bit of a compromise that we work towards, because I, I was well aware, I think you and I maybe even spoke about it in the last session, and I I'd absolutely understand and I'm sympathetic. It's just trying to strike a balance, and I hope that offer to set it up um, is, is a sort of fair compromise to allow that to happen. Uh, what we can't do, as I say, is to be having staff paid into the evening to support those groups. I think that's uh, both a practical and a sort of principal point. But yep. um, And again, I'm very happy if, if those particular groups and if you're involved in them want to speak to us separately, um, I'll, I'll certainly facilitate discussion with the broadcast team to sort of help make sure that uh, we do as much as we possibly can within the rules. Okay, thank you. I want to broaden it out and invite members to put forward any other questions that they have. And I'll, let me start this off. Um, paper. We seem to have an enormous, enormous quantity of paper running through this place. It strikes me that very often it isn't generated from within here. I think we're doing some good work on reducing the amount of paper that's self-generated, but we do seem to get an awful lot mm. from external sources. Can I ask your take on that subject and what thoughts you might have given as to how we could tackle the issue? Yeah, I mean, we do generate a lot of internal paper, it has to, has to be said, and I think the, uh, the move to digital meeting packs for committees and many and the business bulletin, I think, have, uh, have really helped. And we've got, a, I think, a target for a further 25% reduction in this session. So we're, and it's allowed us also to deliver very substantial financial uh, savings as well. Uh, so that's what we can control. And a lot of that's about technology and then just the way we all behave. Um, um, it's a really interesting point, actually, about what happens externally. Um, and I think... Uh, um, I was aware from a conversation we had, which I hadn't really thought about, to be honest, until you mentioned it to me, about the amount of paper which just comes in unsolicited to members. I think, uh, and I, I, I'm going to take that away, I think the balance we need to strike is, I don't think members would thank us for choking that off, because who's, who's to say that's not something they want to read? Mm -hmm. Who's to say they don't want to read it in paper format? But I was just thinking about this after, after our conversation, and it might be that we could do some kind of um, survey of members and finding out what their position was, because it could be there are a relatively small number of organizations that generate a lot of this. Mm -hmm. and, and my approach to that would be to go to those organizations and say, why don't you actually ask members how they want to have mm -hmm. it? So I say, I'm very, very nervous about, you know, in any way preventing members getting what people think they need to see. That's the essence of your Absolutely. job. But actually, why don't you survey a member and say, you know, do you like it in hard copy or electronically, or dare I say it, not at all? Um, and <laughs> that's maybe pushing it a bit there. But, and that allows at least the member to, to determine. If they still want, I mean, there's some things I still prefer to get in paper copy. So it's a really important point, and, and in honesty, not a point I'd thought too much about until you raised it. So I think we're going to, so I was discussing it with Victoria early, and I think we might start by just engaging with members more widely, get their take on it, and if they're, if they would support that, we could help them, you know, uh, go back to these organisations. And uh, I, it sounds to me as if, because that does then contribute to our problem of waste. I mean, once it's in, exactly. even if we recycle it, and we're all aware that recycling is fine, but it's better, it's not as good as not having it in the first place. So, so I think it's a, so that's, I think, I'd want to go into it carefully and to try and take members with us just to make sure that we don't cross the line into 
preventing people communicating with them, but I, I think it sounds to me as if it's an area that would be helpful to society, but also help our own waste targets. And, and, and within that, perhaps looking at um, how other parliaments have responded to yeah. that challenge, because presumably, you know, our colleagues across Europe will have the same yeah. issues about volume of paper that's coming in. We'll, we'll happily engage with them and see whether we can't learn, learn lessons. Um, yeah, if, if anyone else has cracked this problem, it would be it would be great to know how they've done it. So, uh, yeah, and I, again, I'm more than happy to keep the committee in touch with how we're getting on with that. That would be useful. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Yes. As the Parliament starts to look more at indirect emissions, um, I'm wondering to what extent you've done work on looking at pensions and pensions divestment, um, particularly from you know high carbon fossil fuels. Um, it's a contentious issue. Um, what I would say is that the um, sorry, the, sorry, why is it contentious? Well, because you get on the one hand. Um, and I, well, let me, I will come back to that. I'm not, let me just, the, the starting point is actually the pension fund. I mean, is actually managed not by the parliament, by, by independent trustees, as, as it rightly should. We are essentially in the position of the employer. Um, so the, the pen, decisions on actually divestment or anything else would be a matter for the pension fund trustees. The, the contentious that comes in is A, um, not everyone ag agrees with, I mean, you can usually agree on some things, um, some particular areas of, uh, of investment that most people would agree um, raise ethical questions. But in my experience, you get into others, even fossil fuels, where there is a degree of contention. I think that seems to me a matter of, a matter of fact. We live in a parliament with a, with a very diverse range of views on, on these issues. Um, so that, that, that's one point to make in mind. The other one is that any trustees have a challenge between their fiduciary duty to you know, maximise the return to the fund and, of course, you know, their, their view as to what is a proper place to invest. So, um, so that, that's the position. But the, the formal position is quite clear that in terms of uh, your own pension fund, the members, which is the principal one because the staff are part of the civil service pension scheme, so there isn't a fund as such. Um, and obviously member staff is more a matter for, for members. So we're really talking specifically about the pension fund for MSPs. Um, that is handled by fund trustees, the majority of whom are serving or former members of parliament. And you know, I, I know it is something they're very aware of. Um, and they, I know, take very seriously their duty to try and strike this balance mm. between ethical investment, if mm -hmm. I could use that phrase, and the need to ensure that the, the fund is sufficient to meet the obligations of it. Uh, are you aware that there's a lot of good practice emerging within the public sector on this issue? There's been yeah. divestment, for example, of uh, some of the pension funds that operate in Yorkshire. There's been active consideration within the full cut pension fund that serves a number of local authorities in the central belt about how they can invest more in social housing, less in high carbon. And I think yeah. you know, the less contentious bit here probably is the high carbon yeah, yeah. fossil <laughs> fuels rather than North Sea oil and gas. But um, yeah. there is some good practice there which you could draw on and, and yeah. perhaps look at. Well, Because you're a significant employer and you must have some link into the governance structure of these pension funds. Um, well, yeah, actually, no. One has to be very careful. I mean, as the chief executive of the parliament, in a sense, my position, uh, you're not employed as members, you're unique. But we act as the, the employer because we pay the employer contribution and there's actually a very strict and in my view very proper separation between the role of the employer if you like because we have a vested interest let's be honest in the level of contribution we have to make which is to do with the size of the scheme and the trustees of the scheme which have that now what I'm very happy to do and indeed if you want to speak to me offline I'm very happy to write to the trustees with any information they may care to look at. But I need to be extremely careful not to cross that line and try to tell them how to invest because mm -hmm. they actually have a very yeah. strong legal duty yep. as that you'll be familiar with. And I just need to be a little bit careful that I don't cross that line. I think it's perfectly reasonable to, and I'm conscious of having Dave Stewart here knows a lot more about this than I do actually having been in that position, but I'm very happy to draw their attention to good practice. I think that's perfectly mm. reasonable. But then I think I have to allow them as trustees to take a judgment in all the circumstances. Mm -hmm. But if you want to either speak to me or, or flag that up, I'd be more than happy to convey that to the fund okay. trustees. Um, given that you've name-checked him and he's indicated an interest oh, in coming in, I'm <laughs> going to allow Dave Stewart to comment. Uh, perhaps just uh, a couple of points, um, conveners, our next trustee and also as 
when I was on the corporate body last time around, I was effectively on the employer side, so I was really saw two sides of this. This is certainly something that, that I raised um, in my time as a trustee, and Mark Ruskell makes some very useful points. I think the key technical issue, though, is that because of the size of the fund, that we're still a managed fund, which means that Bailey Gifford make the investment decisions. As the fund grows and develops in the future, there's an argument for uh, becoming segregated, which means that the trustees would have a more uh, direct role in investment decisions. But as Sir Paul said, there's also a clear legal duty to maximise the returns for each and every one of us here and um, uh, our, our, our family members as well. So there is a tension. I looked very, very closely at this, and it's fair to say that Bailey Gufford, who are you know, an excellent company, um, are very, very conscious of the so-called ethical investment side of this, and I know the trustees have looked very carefully, and there's been some questions at corporate body question time in the last session of Parliament, and I'm sure uh, Mark might look to, to do that in, in that route, because it's coming up very soon. So it's a fair point, but there is some technical constraints which members should be aware of. Alternative approach, Finlay Carson. I hope you don't mind jumping back in a kind of general question. You, you touched on uh, the benefits of spend and save with the lights of the LED lights down in the, in the garage, but you also mentioned the, the budget constraints. Is there any projects going forward which would see a uh, significant impact in our carbon footprint that are being restrained because of the budget you've got to work with? Hmm. I'm trying to sort of give it... A, well, it, it, it's... We could always spend more money. I mean, in, in that sense, you know, we're, we're sort of limited by that. I'm, I'm just going to sort of hesitate because I don't want to sort of give you a, a misleading answer on this. Um, I think we've got a reasonable budget at the moment going forward. I mean, there's a good discipline about having a cap budget. It does make you really look out. I mean, yes, yeah, I was talking earlier um, uh, to Victoria. I mean, there are some technical issues I'd like us to address around... For example, heating, you know, I think there's more, with greater investment perhaps in, in that we can get more efficiencies. Um, um, I think there's, and, and, but they're quite chunky bits of investment by which I mean, you know, maybe more than 100,000 pounds. So that sort of money you have to think very, very carefully about. Um, but at the moment, I would say there is, there is nothing in the pipeline that we want to do that we don't think we can fund. If not this year, we tend to do it in a rolling program going forward. So I, I think we've got a a reasonable balance at the moment, and I feel, and, and, and I hope uh, Dave Stewart won't mind saying, you know, if I felt that we were really falling down on this, or for example, in danger of missing the target, then I think I would get a sympathetic hearing at the corporate body, and of course, ultimately, before your colleagues on the finance committee. So it, it's hard to get a public sector chief executive ever say he's got enough money, um, and I'm, I'm not saying that. Uh, but, um, but I think we've got a reasonable budget um, and it has a lot. I think we've had a good program investment, and I think going forward, we should be able to achieve that. If we hit any really big items, you talked about district heating. I, you know, I think it's a really, really interesting area. I imagine at a decision-making point, there might be some pretty substantial investment. That would be the sort of issue that we wouldn't budget for. And I think if you hit that sort of issue, I think it would be a question of working up a business case, trying to persuade the corporate body in the first instance, and then probably trying to persuade the finance committee to to do it. So uh, short of those issues, I think we've got enough of a resource to keep a steady programme. And I think the discipline of having to think hard about it is quite a healthy one. Thank you. To wrap things up, um, we've talked today about the 2020 target and your confidence that you're on the right track yeah. to hit that. But the Scottish Government, Scotland, has targets way beyond that. Yeah. I think the government has a target, it was at 68% cut by 2027 for the business industry and public sector. What work's being done from your perspective to look beyond 2020? Can you give us a, an idea what you're looking at target-wise yeah. beyond that? I think the first thing to say is that, um, you know, we would be absolutely determined to hit that those targets as well. I mean, we've on, always regarded 2020 as, a, as an interim point. It's not, it's not the end. Um, and we're well on track, and certainly we'll, we'll, we'll exceed that if we possibly can. But yeah, we see it as a stepping stone to the, the really significant targets that lie beyond that. Um, and the way we achieve that, I think we need to really continue to work hard on behaviour, and we talked about transport, the way we use things in the organisation. Mm -hmm. I think all of us, and I absolutely include myself in that, can do, can do more. I think to get the really big step change, however, going forward, probably is back to this point about investment. Um, for example, I think uh, 
um, if we're going to be generating more of our own electricity, I think, looking at the way we um, generate heat and cool things down in the, you know, and some of these, there is no escaping pretty significant capital investment. So I think it's by that, I think probably it's, it's those probably quite significant investments going forward, plus continued behavior change. But, but I, I'm confident, I mean, we're on a really good trajectory. And what, I, what encourages me is not based just on one thing. I mean, it's across virtually all the measures. And I think that encourages me to think that it's a broad-based um, approach. And I, I, I was absolutely um, well, as confident as I can be that we would hit those more demanding targets out past 2020. OK. Well, thank you very much for your time. I think that's been quite interesting. There are obviously a number of uh, items you've gone, yeah. you've taken away to, to look at, and uh, we'll anticipate hearing from you in due course around those. I'd also like to think in future years we might have a, a rerun of, of such an opportunity to sit and discuss the Parliament's performance, particularly as we look to the uh, longer term. Um, so thank you for attending. Um, uh, at, just to wrap things up, at its next meeting on the 20th of September, the committee will take evidence from a range of stakeholders and academics on the Scottish Government's climate change targets. Uh, as agreed earlier, we will now move into private session. I ask that the public gallery be cleared and the public part of the meeting is closed. Thank you. <laughs>